we may start uh, so good afternoon and i am the host for today my name is ritu rana and i work with equation india the organization committed to work for the cause for the cause and care for elderly we are living in a world where longevity has increased while the longevity is an accomplishment of modern society and medicine but it also brings some challenges to lead a healthy life accessibility to affordable quality healthcare is a must today with us we have an esteemed panel here from who sierra office who india nimhans faculty of management studies the uh, delhi university and apollo hospitals to discuss the issues of elderly healthcare and to know how the gap can be bridged with this i welcome you all the panelists and the participants so as people age they are more likely to experience multi morbidity due to long term chronic non communicable diseases commonly called as ncds like diabetes hypertension heart diseases and respiratory issues we have with us dr cherian workies regional advisor non communicable diseases at southeast who southeast asia region and uh, dr vargis has an extensive work in ncds he has done a lot of work including the special initiatives uh, uh, like uh, cervical cancer elimination he has worked in who india office who western pacific regional office and also who headquarters jaipur i would request uh, dr vargis to let us know what is the burden of ncds in elderly in india particularly for diabetes and hypertension and how it differs from the developed countries over to you dr ritus thank you uh, dr ritu uh, good afternoon to everyone and uh, thank you for giving who this opportunity to look at uh, non communicable diseases in the elderly it certainly is a priority for the elderly so as mentioned i work at the who southeast asia regional office and my colleagues from other parts of who are also joining ritu used to work with us in who so it is good to sort of connect with ritu again and uh, thank you for this invitation first of all let me say well done to help age india and ritu for developing this report which is quite uh, good in terms of uh, as the title says in bridging the gap and looking at what are the needs of the elderly so thank you for for coming up with such a uh, useful report uh, in this area of work i think this audience uh, is fully aware of the global epidemiological transition and uh, there is uh, no better way to show the the proportion of non communicable diseases light blue communicable diseases green and injuries dark blue across the world from 2000 to 2010 to the last point is 2019 um and again uh, alzheimer's disease is coming hard this is diabetes as expected non communicable diseases takes priority but what is even more interesting if i put this waves across africa southeast asia and europe you can actually see when it comes to africa it is the green which predominates with substantial communicable disease as epidemiological transition takes place in southeast asia you can see how the green is really going down in that wave pattern and the blue waves are coming up and once it comes to europe the green is almost non existent and the whole picture is uh, is blue so as we say age is the single most important predictor of non communicable diseases other than tobacco or alcohol physical inactivity or anything as people age even if they are perfectly in healthy habits they will still get non communicable diseases as organ systems fail as we age because the, the, there is a certain amount of degeneration just look at what is the global priority i'm not saying that hiv is not a priority look at people living with hiv in different parts of the world in terms of their numbers and proportions and people living with high blood pressure is there one one thousandth of the effort that is put in hiv in hypertension control i don't think so what is the average control of hypertension among people who are treated for hypertension 10% that means when people are 
coming diagnosed with hypertension in a health facility and when they are treated and after follow up only one 10 out of 100 only one in 10 gets controlled compared to hiv where people with hiv are offered uh, diagnostic testing dedicated service delivery model complaints to medication social support and uh, uh, results are also known as to what proportion of people are on treatment with CD4 count. Why is blood pressure a poor disease or blood pressure is something that we just take it lightly? It is not. One fourth of the adults have hypertension. That is, if you take any population, especially in this part of the world, 25 to 30% is the prevalence of high blood pressure and it is the single most important risk factor for heart attack, stroke, renal disease, blindness, and various other conditions. Of course, diabetes, 50% uh, of people will have diabetes. 50% of people with hypertension will have diabetes also. Cancer, another major chronic disease. I'm just using some other countries' data. Just look at the age-adjusted incidence rate of uh, cancer. Uh, as by the time of 70 to 80 years old, a substantial part of the population will get cancer. But there is always people will say, oh, I know a child with four years with leukemia, that is there. But I'm saying at the level of the population, if you look at the cancer incidence, cancer incidence significantly goes up by age. Um, so, and then they, there is the issue of multimorbidity. By the time a person is 60 or 70 years of age, they will have all this... Uh, intervention. So if, so if visually challenged people are seeing an elephant like uh, an, an animal like elephant, it is like holding different parts of the elephant and saying that is the condition. So I think we need to sort of think of the whole system as to what happens in multimorbidity. So I just wanted to introduce in addition to age being the single most important predictor of NCDs, age also brings in multimorbidity. So this is a study, this is a SAGE wave one, so it is some time back. But even at that time, if you look at China, Ghana, India, Mexico, Russia, South Africa, and look at any morbidity in the age group of 60 to 69, it is 83.5%, okay? And when it comes to multimorbidity, it is 50%. So that is 50% of the people in the age group of 60 to 69 have got one of, more than one of these conditions, which is angina pectoris, arthritis, asthma, chronic lung disease, diabetes, hypertension, stroke, or low visual acuity. So that is going to be really, really massive. And uh, availability of health services uh, from the perspective of the elderly and the caregiver. Let's not get into the details, but but what is the challenge this multimorbidity will bring? Conflicting medical advice. A person goes to one person, gives you a lot of um, medical uh, advice, then it goes to somebody else. Uh, and that will lead to duplicate lab test, duplication of medications, medications which are sort of contrary to each other. Adverse drug events will be happening then. And then because of the pill load, uh, there will be poor complaints to medicines. And then finally leads to poor functional status, unnecessary hospitalization, and high mortality. So multimorbidity itself is, is, is a condition which needs to be looked at, uh, especially in elderly. As, as we have seen, 50% of the elderly will have multimorbidity. So I think a comprehensive approach is critical. And again, I just heard from Ritu about the the uh, mobile vans that you offer for healthcare for the elderly where multiple conditions are being looked at. And I think that should really be replicated. Not only that they are, there are multiple conditions, they all sort of feed into each other like TB and diabetes. All of you know the, the linkage between TB and diabetes or cancer and other conditions, cancer and depression. Mental health is one of the highest comorbidities that we really are missing out and that needs to be looked into. So what do we do instead of focusing on disease, we have to focus on health and creating an enabling environment. I was reading about assisted living and other things coming up in different parts of India and in other parts of the world, which has been there for the last 30, 40 years. But we cannot follow the Western models. I think in Asia, we have to develop our own models of um, sustainable living and um, assisted living in, in our parts of the world. And of course, uh, a person-centered approach is, is important whereby, again, I think rather than having all these esoteric terms, if you really look at how do we optimally manage multimorbidity, then naturally it will become a person-centered approach. 
one of the uh, concerns again similar to the assisted living and uh, technology we have to always look at what is the context in this this is going to be applied unfortunately most of the global guidance and evidence comes from very high income settings as you can see we are three people in the opd is a crowd compared to OPDs that we have where 100 people is a light OPD. So we have to look at what is possible and what is contextually relevant. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that many publications also. I was again talking to Ritu to say that out of this 100 uh, or 200 uh, mobile vans, what about the data on elderly in, in, and how they are taken care of? I think such data should be published more and then only we will be able to take appropriate uh, decisions. Then, of course, mental health, psychosocial support and palliative care, which runs across all conditions, have to be prioritized. I'm sure uh, Dr. Atre Ganguly and others uh, from WHO will speak to this. But again, often, often left out and often considered as an afterthought rather than the, the main um, interventions. As again, a reason for addressing multimorbidity is to have a unified medical record, because otherwise they'll have six different medical records for 10, 10 different conditions. With uh, the, these are challenges, but I think we should look at the, the glass as half full, I would think, because Aadhaar is becoming Aadhaar for people to know is a, is a unique ID in India. And other things are coming up. Um, Web-based applications, mobile applications are becoming more applicable to our settings. So I think we'll have to move towards that rather than keeping on saying nothing and be done or paper-based issues are difficult. And towards the end, we should really look at good surveillance and monitoring. Don't overburden with surveys. Try to get secondary data. Try to analyze the existing data. There's a lot of data being collected. I can tell you there's a lot of being data being collected, but most of the time it is not even used. Even in many surveys, um, an average prevalence is presented by men and women, and that is it. Even if you look at age-specific prevalence, what is the prevalence between 40 to 60? What is the prevalence between 60 to 79? That immediately will give you a lot of um, information on how to act. And finally, I would say implementation research is important because many of these areas are not known. HIV, TB, malaria, maternal child health immunization has been going on for 50 years. Many parts of the world has done this well. So we can copy, we can do fast. Whereas uh, NCDs and elderly, not many countries in the world have done well in, in primary care or anything. I don't think any country has done well. Even high income countries are actually putting a lot of money and uh, preventing mortality. Their morbidity is still very high. Their mortality is, is less because they have very good tertiary care and then people don't die and the death is postponed actually. So we have to really look at what is feasible in this part of the world. And of course, we have only eight years for the SDG, so it's a time to accelerate. Uh, I think there are some concerns about some of the indicators not covering all ages, but don't worry about that because uh, indicators are tracer indicators and um, nobody says that uh, only that particular age group should be managed or anything. For example, the SDG 3.4 says that premature mortality from NCDs, but that is in no way to say that uh, mortality after 70 is acceptable. It is not acceptable. We should do as much as possible, but then we have to be realistic as to what, what can be done. So with that, I will stop and uh, thank you, Ritu, for the opportunity and wish the seminar all success. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sherin, but I would like to you uh, to stay for uh, for a while. I know uh, you have a busy schedule and uh, you, you have given a, a 15 minutes time uh, to us and you want to leave early, but I request you to stay for a uh, for time. But I just have a one question while uh, our uh, participants can put their questions in Q&A section and uh, we may uh, the panelists can look at uh, those questions and may answer uh, during the course of the webinar. But I have uh, one question uh, to you, Dr. Varghese. Uh, so uh, you have mentioned that uh, multimorbidity and then the multi-prescription and uh, I would say the visit to multi-facility uh, by the person because he has he is suffering from many more diseases. So from that perspective, a person has to take four or five medicines at a time. And, and so where the adherence uh, and compliance to the uh, to the prescription and the management is very poor uh, in this category, particularly. So, what can be done, and how can we uh, make it more compliant uh, for the elderly? Because this the, it is very difficult to have five seven medicines at one time. Yeah, that that is a critical issue 
Ritu, uh, I was reading about some of the developments um, in the US where they have somebody called a hospitalist, now not internist, hospitalist who is an internal medicine doctor. So if a person goes to the hospital, that hospitalist decides which are the specialists this person will go and then no specialist will give their own medication to the patient. They will all give the prescription to the hospitalist and that central person will actually decide, okay, so there is a lot of diuretic here or this is high, this is low and then adjust that. So that is one way of sort of optimizing the prescription is what I would say. Second, there are a lot of opportunities. For example, there are poly pills for total cardiovascular conditions where which can address um, hypertension, a bit of diabetes, a bit of uh, aspirin and everything. Even for hypertension, there are poly pills uh, which are fixed dose combinations or a combination of of multiple medications, which will immediately reduce the pill load from four to five medicines to one medicine. So we'll have to really promote these things. What happens is there's a lot of therapeutic inertia. Um, people who are doing something for the last 10, 20 years just continue to do that. So we need a departure from that. But at the same time, finally, uh, even giving these medicines in some sort of nice packages like the, I, for want of a better example, the oral contraceptive pills, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, what do you take? Some sort of um, simplified approaches can also help. Plus, I think the most important thing is to have family medicine type uh, specialist who can actually look at multiple issues and say which which one needs treatment because some of them may not need all the medicines when you look at the totality of the issues and in a comparative manner. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Dr. Varghese for running that overview and, and some uh, tips uh, where we can uh, reduce a, a, bit, a bit about this multi prescription and, uh, and multi uh, uh, polypharmacy. And, uh, uh, and you mentioned that uh, out of uh, one, uh, one fourth of the population is uh, elderly population is having hypertension, but only one in 100 has controlled uh, uh, blood pressure supply. So and we also here and obviously in, uh, in India, it is mentioned that prevention is always better than cure. It is, it is, it is well said uh, from centuries. So uh, let us know some of the preventive aspects. How can, how can a person be healthy and prevent the onset of blood pressure, diabetes, uh, kind of non-communicable diseases. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one in four hypertension is across the board. Every adult, if you look at 18, 18 years and above, but if you look at, I think, 60 years and above, prevalence of hypertension will be 40 to 50 percent, almost one in two will have. Um, at every stage, prevention is possible, the different levels of prevention, because um, but we have to again balance it because in the elderly sodium, um, low sodium is an issue, but they can really look at uh, salt reduction, which can actually control their hypertension to a, a large extent. Uh, physical activity relative to their uh, physical strength is still possible, which can control diabetes and hypertension substantially in addition to pharmaceutical interventions. Um, of course, they can stay away from tobacco at any age. It is going to be beneficial. So all the prevention elements that we say at across the age group are applicable, equally applicable. I think one doesn't have to give up the idea that, okay, anyway, I'm going to have all the NCD, so I'm going to sort of indulge in all risk factors. But so I think that prevention element is still still very much uh, valid. I'm, I'm, ask, I'm seeing other people wanting to comment, but just on Dr. Gauri Sengupta, uh, what I would say is that that is exactly the beauty because uh, the primary care settings have variation. So if you look at the state I come from Kerala or compared to other states, we could actually see what is the enabling environment in the different states in Odisha or in Meghalaya or in Madhya Pradesh because uh, the way ashas are used are different, the way the health system is organized is different, the way the private sector is providing NCD services is different. So I think that, that itself gives a lot of uh, uh, implementation research questions. Thank you, Ritu. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. I would last point. I just have one message for our audience, uh, for all senior, senior citizens, for us. One last message from your side. Stay healthy at every stage in life. We can incrementally improve the health. It is not that health, health promotion is only possible in school or something. At every stage in life, from whatever situation we are in, we can always get into the improved situation. So I think that is the kind of positive attitude. Uh, but also keep in mind the multimorbidity and the mental health and other issues so that we can actually 
improve upon the mental and psychological conditions and and the general call is for the society to embrace uh, elderly as as very much part of the productive society and not just some afterthought okay we will do something for the elderly also so thank you very much uh, thank you sir and we hope that you stay uh, for for entire webinar but if, if not possible then uh, some for some more time uh, so uh, friends uh, we see that non communicable diseases especially diabetes hypertension is is a, is a huge burden um, uh, in the society and and what we can do we can have a small steps we can take a small steps uh, for prevention uh, what dr varghese has said and also uh, from the polypharmacy and the and the uh, poly prescription i hope that our system a health system is uh, uh, is is going look forward for that and have a single uh, or two or three prescriptions and and there is a system where all uh, all the referrals made are in one single window and a single window can prescribe that uh, that to the patient this is uh, this is my wish uh, with moving forward with this i see that uh, older adults make important contributions to the society we all know that while most of them have good mental health but many are at risk of developing mental disorders like and neurological disorders of substance abuse so we have with us Dr. P. T. Siva Kumar, who is a professor of psychiatry and head of geriatric psychiatry at National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, NIMHAS, Bangalore. Dr. P. T. Siva Kumar will highlight some of the common mental health issues among the older populations and how can we prevent that. Over to you, Dr. Siva Kumar, and welcome to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Ritu, for inviting me for this uh, forum, and I, I think uh, uh, all the esteemed speakers or uh, panelists are uh, going to share a lot of valuable information. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, Dr. Cherian Vargis had actually uh, touched upon mental health uh, and its importance uh, when we talk about NCD. And uh, I think more and more evidence is actually pointing out that mental health uh, forms integral part of uh, NCD, and it actually has a two-way relationship where uh, uh, the mental health issues affects the outcome of uh, NCDs and uh, presence of any NCDs actually increases the risk for mental health issues and the complexity of care also increases. So coming to the mental health in older adults, I think uh, 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 the, I would like to refer to the Longitudinal Aging Study of India, which has actually brought out the national level data where almost one third of uh, elderly population had uh, clinically significant uh, depressive symptoms and around uh, say seven, eight percent of them had diagnosable syndromal depression. So, uh, and also uh, more than 25 percent of people have anxiety symptoms. So depression and anxiety are the most important mental health conditions other than uh, the, uh, the, the other important uh, issue is about also cognitive impairment where again, a lot of people have cognitive symptoms and the prevalence of dementia, again, uh, the data from the uh, available epidemiological studies indicates around five to 6%. But I think with the uh, emerging data, it can uh, probably we have underestimation, it can even still go up. Still uh, with the available information itself, we have more than 5 million elderly individuals uh, having dementia in the country at this point of time. So the, uh, the magnitude of the problem is quite high. And when we take into the concept of uh, healthy aging, we are looking at, uh, say, prevention, promotion of uh, uh, health issues for people uh, who are staying already healthy. And we are also looking at people who have mental health problems to provide treatment so that to be prevent uh, kind of disability. And also in the later stage where we need to actually improve their functioning and quality of life uh, by providing appropriate supportive environment and uh, so that way, uh, mental health uh, issues needs a holistic uh, kind of uh, interventions for the complete range of problems. And uh, the COVID, again, is an important challenge, which uh, I, I think all of you uh, would be aware uh, 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 that the recent World Mental Health Report, which has been published uh, actually uh, uh, by WH, uh, World Health Organization, talks about almost 20 to 25 percent increase in the prevalence of depression and anxiety post-COVID, uh, this is uh, with reference to uh, the whole uh, spectrum of uh, people, uh, the lifespan, uh, the entire lifespan, if you take into account. In, in elderly, I think uh, the, the, the significance is much more. 
uh, and uh, they uh, uh, when we talk of mental health uh, uh, i think the uh, when we talk uh, the the approach to interventions actually the ideally it should be integrated with the general health care and primary health care i think that is the most important challenge and uh, if you look in our context i think lot of people are attending uh, the public health system uh, for ncd care i think there is definite improvement dr gauri sen gupta is there uh, i think with the national program for health care of elderly uh, we have uh, been improving the access for ncds at the public health system but i think the integration of mental health in the primary health care has still not happened still it is centered in uh, the district hospitals or the specialists and uh, we sit in the tertiary care center we see a lot of people having this uh, two page prescription or uh, people coming at very late so i think that is where i think uh, demands has actually been doing lot of work uh, with the various governments and uh, to look at training of the primary health uh, healthcare and even uh, apart from the general uh, adult mental health issues uh, in some of the uh, states like chatisgarh which have been very proactive our uh, team has uh, the community team and the geriatric team and the other specialities have actually started training health workers and doctors in recognizing these mental health uh, problems to, so that they can identify and then treat so uh, uh, the other uh, issue is about uh, having a lot of people who have disability the access to care actually has to become home uh, at homes uh, if you look at developed countries many uh, people actually have evaluations at home I, i in fact that is the ideal place where the evaluation should be there for somebody who is having dementia or somebody who is bedridden to bring to hospital is much more challenging for the patient as well as the family i think that is one area uh, we get a lot of request but the bandwidth, uh, the kind of resources what we have is very difficult and uh, that is something which needs a lot of government push and uh, maybe various organization have developed services where the mental health evaluation can happen uh, or even any health evaluation can happen at home uh, by a primary care physician or even a nurse where a task sharing approach can be there using a tele uh, uh, consultation i think a lot of uh, uh, such uh, visits to the hospital hospital can be minimized at least only for the investigations and uh, for things which cannot be done at home then the other spectrum i think the rehab needs again is hugely unmet uh, persons like dementia they have a lot of people have wandering behavior and then they give you get to hear a lot of uh, kind of uh, news which is very disturbing so people uh, there's a lot of abuse i think your report i think very good report uh, at a national level uh, has uh, documented a lot of issues and elder abuse when we see one of the main reasons is people are not being supported to provide care it is not that everybody actually uh, does abuse willingly people neglect people abuse because they don't have enough support system i think we need to focus on providing appropriate support system also so on prevention there is a lot of scope uh, including in integration of uh, say uh, yoga ayurveda and recently we had the international yoga day and in our program i think nimans has been doing this vayo manas sanjeevni initiative where we have been uh, doing continuous awareness programs with senior citizens and we had a 92 year old senior citizens coming and demonstrating yoga posture uh, yoga as a lifestyle as to how it has helped the person uh, in an online program accessing the technology it was really inspiring that people uh, at any age can be uh, still active and we can promote these changes so i think that has a lot of relevance and the major initiative from the government is the national tele mental health program i think that is kind of kind of uh, going to have a large impact and uh, say if you look at the initiatives from the government the mental health program was launched in 82 almost 40 years later i think this is the one major kind of uh, push from the government where uh, the access to service uh, through using technology telephone uh, helplines is going to be integrated across the country with nimans being the nodal center and 23 centers of excellence uh, is going to host these uh, centers at the regional level or state level and the trained volunteers will be doing the first uh, level of care or the non specialist and then it will be linked to the government uh, system public health system where specialist health care is going to be available i think we are all looking for this program to be launched shortly and uh, uh, i think uh, i will stop here so if there are any questions i can take oh uh, thank you dr sivakumar and uh, may uh, to share that task 
uh, shifting can help uh, in, in screening at homes and uh, by the community health workers or either the fam family physicians at home. It would be easy rather than uh, bringing the person to the to the hospital, which, which, which is much more difficult. And we see that uh, one third of the population, the population is uh, having either the depression and 25%, one fourth is having anxiety uh, disorders. So, but my question here is, uh, while uh, uh, the participants can post their questions in Q&A section, my question here is during the COVID time, we have seen that uh, elders were advised to stay at home and for a long time, and they could not meet with their with their peer uh, groups or, or even the family members. So how does it affect it to them? Um, did you see a uh, more number of patients in flux uh, into the OPDs uh, in, in this categories uh, during the COVID time and after that? I think uh, 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 the evidence has actually shown that there is significant increase in depression and anxiety across the population, uh, including elderly. In clinics, I think the services were very much disrupted in the initial period. We are seeing the after effects of that. People coming with more with severe depression, the footfalls have increased once the second wave, third wave has actually uh, subsided. So definitely, yes, there are more problems. And uh, uh, with respect to elderly, I think it is also, uh, uh, we need to uh, be aware that even during normal times, people experience a lot of social isolation and uh, loneliness. So that has always been the case. Uh, I think the, the younger people came to know more about the impact of social isolation and loneliness uh, during the COVID. But some of the elderly uh, had always experienced this, and particularly those with physical challenges and who cannot move out. Uh, this was al already there. But it affected everybody because a lot of uncertainty, a lot of stress. They are not able to meet the family members and people in institutions. I think we did a program with uh, HelpAge India in, uh, uh, to provide mental health support in old age homes. And we could see uh, how much of impact it was created uh, because people uh, did not have visitors, did not have any activity programs. So uh, the care was very challenging for them in people where destitute uh, were staying in old age homes. Um, very much uh, the, the, the need for mental health care has significantly increased uh, related to this COVID impact. Uh, uh, thank you. So uh, uh, also, please uh, uh, let us know that how a lay person can identify that the person is having some mental symptoms or mental illness is there or could be uh, there is a possibility of mental illness because uh, there is a lot of confusion and people don't able to understand it, whether it is going, it is a physical uh, problem or a mental problem, or it is a, a something like an, uh, aggression or something like that. So kindly explain us how can uh, it be identified? Uh, thanks, Ritu. I think this is a very important question because uh, when you talk of mental health literacy, even among professionals, it is quite uh, limited. So because many times uh, any psychological problem or psychiatric issues are still, uh, there are a lot of people, even uh, doctors, sometimes have a very cynic, uh, cynical kind of attitude. Uh, uh, and a lot of stigma is also there. And uh, the, when it comes to aging, the main distinction is what is normal for aging and what is a symptom or sign of a mental health problem is uh, often a complex issue, which is not easy to distinguish even for professionals. So uh, the, uh, the most important thing is that uh, people should not have look at with the ageist kind of attitude, particularly in our culture, elderly are not expected to do independent functioning. Many times they're quite okay till they have an impairment in uh, basic activities like incontinence, or they're not able to kind of uh, uh, do their uh, eating and uh, 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 dressing. Only then they think it is a problem. I think when, when the complex activities gets affected, they are not actually doing uh, going out, they are not interacting with people. I think that is the first sign where uh, people have to kind of seek help. And uh, when it comes to symptoms, anything which is a change in behavior, which is quite significant and persistent, it needs an evaluation because on your own, uh, people would not, many times they will not be able to distinguish whether it is normal or abnormal. So once stigma goes, people seek out help and then they get it evaluated then it can be distinguished. So the awareness is required for senior citizens as well as all the family members because uh, the, the, very, uh, the, uh, the, the definition of mental health issue itself in, in many of the conditions, severe conditions, the person lacks awareness. So they will not seek help by themselves. So it is their family members or friends or uh, who is uh, available and particularly for people living alone, uh, their society. Uh, if something is changed, I think one has to become a volunteer. 
So in this context, I think our uh, uh, we have been doing this biomanus engineering initiative where we have been continuously engaging senior citizens and uh, doing awareness programs where people have to talk about it and discuss. Then they can actually uh, uh, recognize these problems and mental health literacy programs for all health workers as well as uh, volunteers and public is very much required. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Sivakumar. So we see that uh, a lot of awareness is required at, at the community level, at the, at, the, at the family level, at the patient level itself. And uh, uh, if there is a change in behavior, which is persistent, and then we should seek a support. We should seek uh, advice from the uh, from uh, from the physician and then uh, the psychiatrist or the mental mental health specialist. So with this, I'll come back to you later on with with some more questions. I'm I'm seeing here uh, a comment uh, from Dr. Shiba Nihan, um, who says that with COVID, the normal routine and social connections came to standstill for the older adult. I agree with that. I, I think we all agree with that. And uh, we have uh, a question from, uh, uh, it's not a question, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Chokalingam, who say that, as per his information, who is a cardiologist in Chennai, that geriatric cancer patients died more more during the COVID time, more than the COVID in elders. Is it true? So I, I have no answer to this question as of now. If any uh, one of the panelists has some data, uh, for that uh, answer, please post it. We'll come back to you later on. So with that, I move uh, to my, my next speaker. And we see that there is the issues of non-communicable diseases, including, including mental health. Right? So but what can be done at the community level? And uh, uh, we have with us Dr. Atle Gangi, who is National Professional um, Officer with the WHO India Office. And uh, WHO has launched uh, integrated care for older persons. Uh, a, a kind of guidance uh, for the community, uh, the workers and the healthcare professionals, which can guide us. Uh, how can we plan? How can we plan for the care for the elderly? I move to Dr. Atre. I know hand over to you, Dr. Atre. Uh, welcome to the webinar and uh, have give some light on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritu. Uh, at the outset, I must congratulate you to, uh, for you know, convening this meeting and organizing. We really have uh, good speakers today. It's uh, you know, more uh, for us to learn from the others and also you know, uh, how different perspectives on aging, uh, you know, it will enrich our information. Also, secondly, I must congratulate you for the report, which brought strong evidence and definitely will be a path breaking uh, development in the care of older people. So uh, I have a small presentation. Am I being given the and prior to that, there is a film if uh, you can uh, play that. Um, yes, yes, Dr. Atri, uh, our IT uh, support will uh, do that. Okay. So uh, just to, before you start the film, just, just hold on. I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, I wanted to start with the film because it is echoing the uh, sentiments of what Dr. Uh, Cherian said and how Dr. Shivakumar said that we need to have an integrated approach. It talks about polypharmacy, etc. So this is primarily WHO's view. So if uh, we could just start with this, uh, Dr. Ritu. Sure. The world has committed global goals for sustainable development that are relevant to everyone, everywhere. Part of this promise is that people of all ages get the health and social care they need. But health systems around the world are not yet ready for older populations. Older people often experience more than one health condition at the same time, and these problems tend to be ongoing. Yet, health systems are usually designed to detect and treat individual diseases and conditions. As a result, they tend to manage older people's health issues in fragmented ways, which have negative consequences. For example, older people often struggle with conflicting advice from different health providers. They may be prescribed many drugs that can have negative interactions. They also might pay higher costs for all the different services. Frequently, this fragmentation means that we miss opportunities to manage chronic conditions and prevent people becoming care dependent. But we know 
how health systems can better meet the needs of older populations. Health systems need to shift from managing each disease or condition separately and take a more holistic and integrated approach focused on building and maintaining older people's physical and mental capacity. The starting point for integrated health services is an assessment of the older person's goals, their capacity, and their physical and social environments. This assessment enables health and social care professionals, together with the older person and their caregivers, to develop a care plan where services are coordinated across different providers and settings and delivered in the older person's home or as near as possible. Ensuring universal access to integrated care will offer quality health services and make better use of existing health resources. Most importantly, older people will not be left behind. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ritu. Definitely older people will not be left behind. And since, uh, if I can start my, can I start my presentation? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. Is it visible to everybody? Uh, it's no. not in full screen, uh, the platform. Okay, okay. So while we are waiting for Dr. Adlai's presentation to be uploaded, so we have learned that uh, integrated care for elder person start with the assessment of the goals. And we'll come back to Dr. Adlai regarding the goals. What could be the goals of, of, of the older person? Uh, we'll come back to Dr. Adlai uh, to you later on that. So you can uh, start with your, uh, uh, with your presentation now. Right. Thank you so much. So integrated care of older people, we all know we have been speaking how, you know, we are having verticals and it is time that we have an integrated care, which will be, as uh, Dr. Cherian highlighted, it should be person-centric. And um, so the presentation uh, primarily will talk about uh, why, uh, what is integrated care of older people, how it is beneficial for India. And also uh, I would like to touch upon the decade of healthy aging because uh, UN has declared uh, 2021 to 2030 as a decade of healthy aging, which will give us a lot of opportunities to work for older people. So uh, let's, uh, we'll, I'll spend some time on this. So we all know that the number of elderly are increasing in India. This was the picture when we were students, when we were in college in the 90s. And it is right now, it is somewhat like this in 2019. And further so, it will become like this, which means our older population are increasing, whereas the base, which is consisting of our younger population, they are dwindling. As a result, our support system is dwindling. Our financial uh, resources, the the productive population is dwindling. At the same time, we have a large number of senior population who needs to be supported. So on a public health uh, uh, framework, if you translate this, it is definitely very um, you know, concerning. It's concerning for countries like India, China, uh, Brazil, etc. Because you see here on the extreme left, you have countries like France, Sweden, which has taken about 100, 150 years for their elderly population to uh, you know, grow from 10% to 20%. But on the other hand, you have countries like India, wherein in, at 2020, we are about 10% of the older, uh, the total population, 10% is the older people. And by 2055, we will be the 20% 20, 20 of the entire population will be older people. And on top of that, if we take the sheer numbers, they will be huge, 317 million. Is our health system equipped? Are we fogging the tired health system? So definitely we need to think and we need to uh, devise uh, newer initiatives, which would be win-win for all of us. So what is integrated care of older people? According to WHO, the what is healthy aging? Healthy aging is a process of maintaining uh, the functional ability and enables wellness of older people. This is what uh, echoing what uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar just said. 
so there are two uh, two um, you know the in, important terms which i would like to uh, bring to your uh, light that is what is intrinsic capacity intrinsic capacity is the combination of physical and mental capacities of an individual and what is functional ability which uh, is translating to healthy aging is the combination and interaction of intrinsic capacity with the environment because it is not just the inner health it is also the outside it is also the place where the person lives the environment the you know roads on which they go the transport which they use also have a bearing on their health and mobility so uh, in order to you know uh, highlight this concept i would say that it is basically to maintain the functional ability across life course there is a uh, you know there is nowadays it is being said that healthy aging doesn't start at 60 if one has to be healthy it has to be from the very beginning in fact it is a womb to tomb approach or womb to pyre approach wherein throughout life course between uh, at different levels like dr cherian said health promotion at school health promotion at younger population you know treating and controlling hypertension diabetes and other chronic diseases so that it doesn't get into complications and of course beyond 60 this is very important so that you know people are able to maintain their full capacity i mean their optimum capacity uh, when they reach the age of 60 plus and older people are a resource they have definitely to contribute a lot to uh, you know the uh, the the growth of the country so we must encourage them what usually happens with older people is that uh people uh, are frequently faced with first is the fragmented system because there is specialized doctors and hospitals uh, therefore there are verticals definitely i'm uh, what dr shiv kumar is the need of said is the need of the art task shifting secondly you also have uh, the placement of these uh, health facilities very far away from their place but nowadays with health and wellness uh, centers coming up and also the uh, national program for healthcare of elderly they are advocating healthcare for older people very close to the community thirdly the ageist attitude yes that is also a deterrent for people to access care and um, then there's lack of interventions uh, to optimize the intrinsic capacity and functional ability how to you know rejuvenate or at least to stop the decline because these are very important for anybody to lead a healthy life and so very importantly the integrated care came into being with wherein these are, these questions can be answered to a great extent so what does integrated care of older people or the icope approach what does it do basically it is a community based approach wherein um, it helps to reorient the existing health services and also social services because it is not just the health but the social services which are equally important for the well being of the older people to have a more a person centered approach and also to have a coordinated model so uh, what does uh, you know a person centered approach mean it means maximizing the intrinsic capacity and the functional ability we are talking about you know the mobility of the person the person should be able to move around be independent be able to do their own uh, you know self care also uh, for health promotion their walk their physical activity very importantly also the cognitive um, the functions should be normal should be uh, you know so that they are able to uh, take take forward their lives second is a very uh, you know person centered assessment and personalized care plans which are very important has been highlighted by our earlier speakers as well community based and home based interventions because it is very difficult for older people because of uh, lack of resources many of the older people are not earning they are dependent on the younger generation who may be you know not having sufficient time to take them so if uh, this care is provided at the community level it will be definitely a uh, you know win win for all of us multidisciplinary team yes we need to have the doctors the nurses uh, and uh, other healthcare workers working at tandem with each other task sharing task shifting are the mantra of the day 
also a support to self management encouraging people to take care of themselves and very very importantly the support or to the caregivers in india uh, we still have you know the women who are taking care and uh, like usually uh, the you know if you see an old couple the women is much younger the wife is much younger to the husband so the wife is taking care when the husband is uh, you know growing old and ill but what about the uh, when after the husband dies she is at the you know she is living with her children who will take care of her when she needs that care so the care uh, perspective is also very much skewed and it is very much in favor of the males we really need to think from the equity gender equity lens are we providing enough care for all and secondly also the uh, the you know the we need to have some uh, the support to the caregiver who are always you know tied up so we need to think how to uh, de stress them and how to sort of bring them back to you know the normal uh, routine also very importantly referral and follow up this we need to refer as and when required and ensure follow up for proper coherence to uh, the treatment uh what does ico basically stand for here you have people with high um, intrinsic capacity this is relatively younger age and then when people grow old there is significant loss so this is the part when the decline starts so what does ico says that if we work on this population who is declining and who has declined then we will be able to provide quality life to our older people so uh, basically what are the services or what are the a domains we are looking for firstly comes depressive symptoms why am i starting with depressive symptoms uh, dr shiv kumar and others uh, please correct me that whenever a person is there with some depressive symptoms they are not you uh, know not adhering to the treatment protocols they are not cooperative in terms like they would not their, their expression their of signs and symptoms are very different so the first important thing is to see whether the person is going through any depressive episodes second is limited mobility because of limited mobility we have lot of issues coming up uh, nutrition is very important many a times we see that you know older people they are uh, because of financial constraint they are living by themselves children staying away so they are just thriving on something which is very carbohydrate rich and other nutrients are largely lacking so is that is that good is that uh, what what should what all should they be taking what what nutrition uh, how to boost their nutrition i'm not saying that have nutritional supplements but from locally available food how can they enrich their nutrition and visual impairment and uh, hearing loss are very significant uh, uh, significant you know factors for uh, deterring people to have a healthy and you know have a uh, friendly life so who has come up with these uh, guidelines which will provide um, you know care and limit the and prevent care dependency in older people that is the objective people should be on their own they should lead a life themselves so primarily what are the areas which are focused on uh, firstly it is these uh, mobility uh, vitality and this musculoskeletal functions our muscles our limbs should work properly so that people are able to do their work second is uh, the hearing and uh, capacity to hear and see cognitive impairment very important uh, things like urinary incontinence which is a very very major and very you know embarrassing situation for older people uh, we do have men because of prostate and other issues we do have females uh, having this issue because of multiple pregnancies so how do we do that then uh, prevent falls falls is also very very important issue maybe because uh, you know they are uh, because of uh, maybe they are having giddiness or because of vertigo some cervical spondylosis or some knee issue or maybe over uh, medication with anti hypertensives there can be n number of issues but uh, for all is very common with older people and one has to be very guarded for that and of course support to the caregivers which comes without saying that is very important because these are long term care and people should themselves the caregivers should not get exhausted 
So uh, in order to improve the skeletal um, uh, muscle functioning, there are exercises, encourage people to do exercises and also dietary um, advice, which we must tell them to keep their muscles, high protein diet, etc. Then to maintain the capacity to hear and see, of course, there is a visual impairment uh, and uh, hearing these are, you know, which they should be going for frequent tests. And there are, uh, we have spectacles, we have hearing aids, the, the very important role for assistive technology here so these can be you know promoted thirdly psychosocial well-being is very very important so how do we do that cognitive stimulation it may not be a very uh, treatment oriented it can be done by peers by family members or even by the community uh, people but how do we do that simple methodology yet very successful and uh, if there are any um, you know uh, where, wherein you have to take uh, where they need to take treatment WHO has got their image cap. We also have in India the uh, National Mental Health Program, we have, so uh, treatment can be given. Uh, also, age-related conditions like urinary incontinence, we've spoken to, uh, you know, ask to encourage them to do pelvic uh, muscle strengthening exercises and prevent falls, of course. Very importantly, apart from medication and also having uh, muscle strengthening exercises, we also must have, you know, the home... Um, home adaptations like uh, to have railings in the washroom to have you know uh, not too many stairs maybe uh, uh, which are uh, then well lit uh, rooms etc wherein you know people it is easy for older people to see and move around in the dark then also there are multiple other interventions uh, which we can well, for specific uh, uh, diseases that can be uh, given for caregivers of course psychosocial support definitely and 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 as Dr. Cherian was highlighting palliative care, palliative care actually has got a very, very important element of psychosocial support. And it is not just for the family, uh, not just for the patient, but also for the family members and the caregivers in particular to prevent caregiver burnout. So um, there are a plethora of guidelines. Uh, you have the handbook, you have the uh, mobile app also, wherein which can be done. The guidance is there. There is also a self-management app called the Imaging app. And if you want to, uh, this I would not take in detail. There are uh, tools which are prescribed for each of these functions. And now, most importantly, I would say that there are two pathways in, um, in uh, ICO. One is the geriatric care pathway, which talks about primarily the health part. And there is a social care pathway as well. The health part, you actually, if there is any, uh, if you go to the community, you see older people. And if there is no loss of intrinsic capacity, then okay, reassurance and tell them, you know, tips of how to have a good healthy lifestyle. If there are, then they are are assessed as as uh, I mean, our previous speakers had said assessment and if there are any underlying issues um, uh, if there are no underlying issues then uh, refer to the community if there are underlying issues definitely they need to be taken care uh, either refer them to you know integrate it with other diseases it should be it should be not you know verticals but together one uh, including palliative care and and rehabilitation and uh, person centered care and most importantly the the team should be multidisciplinary with physiotherapists with uh, you know palliative care pe pe experts or palliative care i mean i won't say experts in terms of doctors but they should be trained in palliative care they should be trained in counseling etc and then uh, the second part, I would say this is for the social care. And here you can see, you know, a large part of the component is actually, if you see these questions, they are uh, firstly to see whether the person is uh, able to do self-management. They are talking about whether he's having difficulty in taking bath, dressing, etc. Second thing they are talking about, you know, are there any, any um, you know, accommodation where they are saying, uh, staying, are they having any issues with the home, etc.? Third is they are talking about the finances because finances have a very, very important bearing on the health and nutrition. Fourth is lonely and with, you know, our joint family breaking up and, you know, people moving into nuclear families, a lot of migration, both, uh, you know, domestic as well as international people, older people are very lonely. And then uh, they are, are you encouraging them to have some leisure time? You know, we can talk about peer support, like the old, younger elderly, like those who are in the 60s, 
they can go over and help those who are relatively old so that will keep both of them occupied and very importantly the last question is the risk of uh, elder abuse because as you know many a times uh, our previous speaker has said that many a times it is uh, neglect is because you know they're not enough available for them i'm not going to go into the details but there are detailed questions through which a health worker can actually find out these issues and Yeah. And then finally, I would uh, talk about the decade of UN decade of healthy aging. This is a very important window of opportunity. And, and I'm, I must once again congratulate, uh, you know, Help Age India for bringing together people from uh, different sectors so that people can work together and there need to be cross pollination of ideas. The, the, there are three important, uh, you know, pillars for decade of healthy aging. The first one, they're saying that doing things differently. Differently. We are seeing how digital, um, you know, digital technology is being used in a big way, especially during the COVID times. Secondly, is reorienting the health services and, and our uh, government of India is taking so many progressive steps, including the National Program of Healthcare of Elderly and also the Health and Wellness Center Geriatric Package. And you have the NGOs also like uh, HelpAge India who are contributing in this task. And thirdly is the environment. Uh, we need to not only just talk about health of the older people, but we have like uh, only this month, we have the 15th of uh, June, wherein, you know, elderly abuse day was celebrated. So it is not just the health of the older people, but it is the, you know, the respect and uh, how our value uh, the, the society gives to the older people. They are all determinants of how healthy our older people would be. And, and uh, to last sentence is that if we invest today, we will have a better tomorrow because most of us in some time will become into the elderly bracket and we'll have a better future for ourselves. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abhay. Definitely we'll have a better better uh, tomorrow. And I see that integrated care of uh, older person, integrated the physical health, the mental health, psychosocial health, and also the nutrition and health promotion activities. So I have um, uh, one question with uh, you and uh, other speaker, other panelists and the speakers and the participants have some questions we may, they may put in, uh, in the, in the Q&A section. So uh, has this been implemented uh, in in, in India or some other parts of the of the world, and uh, what could be the the training uh, uh, systems or the platforms where people can go and get themselves trained on the ICOP so that they can implement it? Okay, thank you so much for the question. Well, uh, this is a very very new uh, concept. It just came into being probably just before the COVID, and uh, in some of the uh, Western countries do have this. Um, when uh, during the COVID times, we had our uh, regional office. In fact, uh, it started uh, this this endeavor started before COVID itself. Our regional office uh, they trans they sort of adapted these. Um, uh, there are modules for training different cadres, uh, be it the uh, non specialist medical officers, because there is a dearth of geriatricians not only in India but the entire Southeast Asia region. So and also for the um, you know nurses who are into geriatric care, also for the community health workers. Also, there is another set of module for long-term care, because as I said, you know, older care is a long-term and we need to. So these modules are uh, now being, uh, you know, on a pilot basis being implemented in few countries in our region. But uh, yes, WHO is there to provide support. And if anybody needs training, we'll be happy to uh, help. And, and uh, I can also share the links from which which these these modules are freely available they can download them and they can you know use it for the training of their own uh, staff yes uh, thank you so I, I think we must come uh, back to you to the who for uh, i uh, training because our mobile health uh, you know doctors and the teams uh, it would be beneficial for them and the community uh, to have this. With this, uh, I'll, I'll come back to you again um, after uh, having a panelist and questions. So we certainly need a roadmap to comprehensive healthcare for the elderly. And for this, I have with us Dr. Gauri Sen Gupta, Dr. No Dr. Gauri Nambiar Sen Gupta, who is Assistant Director General of Public Health and Director General of Health Services, Government of India. Dr. Uh, Gauri has been uh, implementing 
the, the largest uh, healthcare program for the elderly in India and has been also looking some of the uh, other uh, major programs which probably are beneficial for the older population like national program on the palliative care. Welcome uh, Dr. Gauri Namiya Senguta to the webinar and uh, I would request uh, to you to let us know uh, that what are the different components of the national program for healthcare of elderly and uh, how how can we all as an as NGO, as a private players, can support and can help uh, and can uh, get into that uh, part of the healthcare program for the elderly and uh, uh, help the community uh, as overall. Over to you, Dr. Gauri. Yeah, so good afternoon, Dr. Ritu. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you so much. I thank Helpage and all the other panelists also uh, for this very, very uh, comprehensive webinar, I must say, although the it is subsequent to a report which has come out specific to uh, elders in the social sector, but considering that the healthcare requirements of elderly are of paramount importance, so I think uh, it is at a very opportune moment. Uh, unfortunately, I did not know that I had to get a presentation, but um, as far as the National Program for Healthcare of Elderly is concerned, uh, I'm sure most of the people now are aware this program initiated way back in 2010-12. However, in the initial uh, five years, it was very slow to pick up because it was supposedly a pilot program to be implemented only in the 100 districts of the country. And overall, if you see now that we have the NCDs in the limelight, we do have geriatric health also talked about, but I'm sure uh, Helpage and you being in this field for more than a decade, uh, you will agree with me that as far as geriatric health is concerned, it is not something which is considered very important to even address. Uh, if I may not be quoted wrongly, I would say COVID came as a blessing in disguise because in COVID, the elderly suffered and they were brought into the limelight and as vulnerable section, all aspects, including preventive, promotive, curative and rehabilitative aspects of healthcare came into the forte. And now that we have a lot of emphasis and a lot of uh, importance on geriatric health, I'm sure we'll be able to move away from just curative and rehabilitative services to preventing and promoting health, even amongst the elderly population, that is 60 plus population in our country. As far as the National Program for Healthcare of Elderly is concerned, uh, in the last six to seven years, it gives me immense pleasure to state that all the 728 districts of the country have been sanctioned for delivery of geriatric care services. I will explain what that means, but what is important to note is what Dr. Cherian had said, Dr. Sivakumar had said, and what Dr. Atri had also mentioned is that we are not talking at just the national or the state levels, but we are starting with at least the district as a unit. So we're trying to get it as close to the people as much as possible. Now, in the program, you have three important aspects. Firstly, is comprehensive geriatric care services, right from tertiary level, to secondary and to primary level. At the tertiary level, you have close to 19 medical colleges in the country who have been sanctioned grant of funds, manpower, infrastructure, machinery, and most importantly, their one very big mandate being development of postgraduate students in geriatrics. So capacity building being one of the most important aspects of tertiary care, not just 
curative disease service delivery, but also developing geriatricians for the future. And simultaneously also developing the capacities of the existing healthcare staff in all the country, in all the programs towards geriatric care. So if it may be a medical officer at the PHC, if it is a staff nurse at the CHC, if it is a community health officer who is there at the health and wellness centers, even up to the district hospitals, all the existing workforce of the country to be oriented towards delivering comprehensive geriatric care services. And for this, 19 medical colleges have already been sanctioned and hopefully we'll be able to sanction at least one medical college per state to be as a resource center for that particular state. Coming to the secondary care, the secondary care is provided at the district hospital level and at the community healthcare center levels. At the district hospitals, it is mandated under the program to have a minimum 10 bedded geriatric ward, five male, five female, or 10 male, 10 female, depending upon the state, but at least a minimum 10 bedded geriatric ward, daily geriatric OPDs, physiotherapy services or rehabilitation services, and Along with all this, one-stop delivery of services. Initially, it was very difficult, so it was piggybacked onto the NCD clinics, that is the non-communicable disease clinics, which were already available in the district hospitals and had around 80% of the elderly frequenting those clinics. So most of the hypertension and diabetes patients were all 60 plus. So the NCD clinic was given the mandate of also operating the geriatric clinic. But now over a period of five years, in a number of states, in a number of districts, a separate geriatric OPD exists and provides exclusive consultation to elderly. And a lot of medical officers, physicians have been trained to address the two most important things which you were also discussing with Dr. Cherian. First and foremost, polypharmacy. That is one elderly having at least minimum five to six medicines in one prescription. And unfortunately, with the multimorbidity being there with elderly, if an elderly goes to a joint specialist and after that, the elderly needs to go to a dentist and also needs to go to an ophthalmologist or an ENT specialist, I am sure we will have four different prescriptions with at least minimum four drugs each, which will amount to 16 drugs which I'm sure even you and me cannot have and sustain for even three days or five days in the coming years. So the basic training purpose was to address multimorbidity, how to manage it effectively within the existing system and if possible required take external assistance. And secondly, polypharmacy not only Teaching people to address polypharmacy has been one of our very, very major concerns because telling people to cut down the prescription is not just teaching doctors. It is also important to sensitize the elderly because it is a two-pronged sword. Most of the people are very conveniently habitual of taking around six to eight drugs and some of them actually like taking it so explaining those things to them that you know we're not taking away your medication but we are just trying to prevent complications from one being addressed by another medication so 
comprehensive prescription writing addressing polypharmacy has one of has been one of the uh, backbone of the capacity building trainings advocacies that we have conducted at the district hospital it is also imperative that there be a kind of a synergy between at least the non communicable disease programs so what dr shiva kumar was talking about that the mental health program staff the elderly care program staff the non communicable diseases npcdcs staff the blindness program staff deafness program staff and of course palliative care staff talk to one another do cross referrals with one another and try and harmonize the experience of giving the care and not just duplicating the same kind of services everywhere so that is one of the challenges which we have taken up we are still in the process of streamlining it and hopefully we should be able to come to some kind of a consensus in the very near future as to how to deliver multidisciplinary care to a person more than 60 years of age who visits either a district hospital a community health center a primary health center for more than one ailment so that is the challenge that we have put up for ourselves on the program coming to the community health center they are mandated with biweekly opd and domiciliary rehabilitation services for all these services funds for infrastructure for equipments and also for manpower like at the community health center there is a manpower called multi rehabilitation worker which is one person per community health center which is not available with any other program across the country and this person is supposed to provide institutional care for two days a week and home based rehabilitation care services for the remaining four days of the week and the person is also being provided with a kit so that rehabilitation services can be provided to a certain extent whatever is possible can be done at the home based level the third most important thing under the program which is a major achievement and that is primary level geriatric healthcare so under the ayushman bharat health and wellness center program the 11th package that is to be provided is geriatric and palliative care services so that was one of the biggest advantages of getting that inclusivity of elderly into the program so with the ayushman bharat health and wellness centers close to 1.5 lakh centers across the country mandated to provide elderly and palliative care services i am sure that in the coming future we will be able to take a lot of elderly care services right to the grassroots level and eventually to the home level so for this also a lot of work has gone in funds have been released trainings have been conducted reorientation of the existing anganwadi workers anms multipurpose workers and the one cadre of community health officers which is coming up is being sensitized massively for delivering uh community based elderly as well as palliative care one very important aspect of this particular primary care is also india's commitment to the decade of healthy aging that one of the pillars of decade of healthy aging that is combating ageism so like we've had people talking about it we've always said 60 plus 70 plus 80 plus agers super agers young old 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 very old and all those kinds of things which is kind of very ageistic so this is the first time that the guidelines have been drawn not based on the age criteria 
but based on their mobility criteria. So for the program, we are in the process of revising the operational guidelines and hopefully we'll be able to launch them that this will be the first time that at the national level, we will have a program which although requires somebody to be more than 60 years to have the benefits of the program, will not categorize elderly as 60 to 69, 70 to 79 and 80 and above and 90 and above, but will categorize them as those who are absolutely mobile, elderly, elderly with restricted mobility, those who require some assistance, either in the form of a device or in the form of a person to assist them in conducting daily activities. And lastly, homebound elderly. So it could be an elderly who is just temporarily homebound. It could be a massive stroke, which has rendered the elderly homebound for say maybe eight months or a year or so. Or it could also be somebody who is absolutely bed bound and requires intensive palliative care and end of life care. So these are the three categories based on which we propose to henceforth provide services. This takes into cognizance the fact that we have a lot of elderly who are very active, who would like to be independent, who would like to have their health in their own hands, and who would also like to assist and help other elderly who are not so active. So all these things are rolled into one small little package and that is our way of combating ageism at the national level. Coming to the latest uh, initiatives, uh, as far as the telehealth is concerned, even on the East Sanjeevani portal, we have comprehensive uh, geriatric care services being delivered. You do have elderly, right from COVID time, we've had call-in and uh, or call-back facilities from our uh, geriatricians at the state level and also in the facility based like in a few AIMS and few regional geriatric centers where you have the departments of geriatric medicine. So other than telehealth, we've also had a number of initiatives which have come in during the COVID times and they will be carried on as very good practices. And I'm sure that we'll be able to pack in very simple, simple interventions into the existing services. We are still in the process of harmonizing service delivery between the various programs. Like for example, with, with, with the national program for control of blindness and visual impairment, 60% of the press biopic spectacles that are being provided are being provided through that program. So a synergy between our elderly care program and the blindness program has led to increase in the funding for the press biopic spectacles so that we can get better quality spectacles for the elderly. And you don't need to venture out of the health sector to get these kinds of things. Things like hearing aids, collars, walking sticks, walkers, calipers, and even to the extent of providing uh, home care, air beds, water beds for end of life care, palliative patients. Uh, examples of having a community level team of a staff nurse and a physiotherapist or a rehabilitation therapist coming once a week to visit people, to train the family members for delivery of care. These are a few of the initiatives which need to be worked on. They need to be strengthened at the grassroots level. And I'm sure that we require all the assistance of all the elders out there in the field. It is not possible with a resource crunched setup of healthcare in the country to go and provide individual care, person-centric care, sounds very good on slides 
but considering that we are talking about more than 330 million going to 303 million population, it is very, very, very difficult to expect healthcare professionals to go out there and actually provide person-specific care. So it has to be a two-pronged approach wherein we have the family members, the elders, the community, and support groups of both NGOs as well as peer support groups working hand in hand with the healthcare system and the healthcare staff to deliver these kinds of person-centered approaches. I'm sure we'll be able to work out something with the assistance of all the uh, sectors together. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gauri. And I'm sure with the, with the Kipster building, the government is providing uh, in the near future, we would have enough geriatricians uh, in the country so that uh, the elder care is provided uh, and everyone is accessible to the, to the quality of healthcare. We hope for the best and we'll move on because I'm also looking at the time. We uh, uh, we are running short of time, but uh, we'll, we'll have, uh, we'll extend uh, the webinar for half an hour extra. So uh, we see that sustainable development goal, SDG3 says that ensure healthy lives and promote well-being at all ages. Right? And the SDG declaration emphasizes that to achieve the overall health goal, we must achieve universal health coverage and access to quality health care. Now, age is a known factor for inequitable access to health. Elderly, particularly those residing in the rural areas and are below the poverty line, is the last person in the line to receive the health care. Uh, we have experienced this and we know all this. So with this uh, context, I request uh, Professor A. Venkat Raman from HRD in Health System, Faculty of Management Studies, Delhi University, to deliberate on policies and possible strategies for equitable access to quality healthcare for the poor, particularly elderly. And one thing I must uh, share here that uh, Dr. Venkat Raman is my guru. So I he taught me in the FMS. So uh, Dr. Shayan Varg is my professional guru. When uh, in my times with WHO and Dr. Venkat Raman is my uh, my the guru in the studies. So over to you, Dr. Venkat Raman. Thank you. Can you hear me, Dr. Ritu? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ritu. It's a pleasure meeting you after a very long time. And thank you also, Helpage, for giving this opportunity to me. Uh, and also to the other panelists for the rich deliberations so far that I have had. And uh, it's a very uh, learning opportunity for me. I must uh, say, that, you know, kind of a thank each and every panelist who has spoken before me. I am very conscious about the time, so I will be very short in my, uh, I don't have a presentation, but I just want to raise a few points uh, so that uh, we could have a greater uh, number of questions or maybe more clarifications uh, thought about. Uh, first of all, congratulations for compiling this very informative study. And linking this study with what the Gauri, uh, Dr. Gauri mentioned, I am very optimistic that uh, the country would uh, 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 would, would be only looking at the bright future for the elderly in terms of uh, healthcare services in a comprehensive manner or integrated manner, as uh, Dr. Atri mentioned. Uh, from your report, I, I gather that there are 82% of elderly women and 70% of the total elderly population rely on someone uh, in the family or otherwise uh, for their care. And about 87% of elderly have health facility available in the vicinity, but have very limited uh, uh, access to them. And 67% of the elderly uh, do not have any form of health insurance. Uh, these are some of the data that you have thrown up with, and these are very uh, important for us to really uh, look at it from the point of view for the deliberation on this. And I also see that 57% of your respondents are looking for fr uh, free OPD consultation. And that's unlikely to happen anywhere. Uh, free OPD would happen only in the government services. But if you look at the problem with uh, health inequity in any country, it's, uh, health inequities are not necessarily uh, <clears throat> exaggerated in India alone. 
it is all over the world. This phenomena is all over the world. And it just varies according to the parameter of uh, inequity that you uh, put forward. So if you were to look at the major cause of wealth inequity in India, I, I guess the first onus is on the poor health infrastructure or poor health in delivery uh, cap capacity of the public health facilities, particularly in the rural and the peri-urban areas, whether we call it in the form of sh staff shortages or shortage of supplies of drugs or uh, non-functioning of uh, uh, equipment, etc. Now, one might say that uh, the central government is not necessarily responsible. These are, these are state is uh, responsible for the uh, health service delivery. But then the governance is not uniform across the states and therefore the healthcare delivery is also very across these uh, states. Uh, states from uh, where some of us come from are much better governed compared to the other states which are uh, much more worse off in terms of caring, you know, uh, giving care to the newborn or the woman or the elderly, leave alone the other members of the community. As a result of this kind of uh, uh, you know, inequity in the form of uh, service delivery capacity, we have close to three fourths of our uh, you know, population uh, seeking healthcare services or OPD services from the private sector. And about two thirds of the hospitalization services in the country is sought from the expensive, unregulated private sector, whose uh, quality is highly debatable and variable. Now, this is where the inequity spreads further. Uh, we know that a significant proportion of India's population fall below poverty line due to healthcare costs, because they cannot afford to pay that, or they sell their assets, they sell their even children in order to meet the healthcare costs. There is an estimate that about 70 million population in India fall below poverty line every year due to hospitalization. We have also seen in the last three decades of uh, NSS data, a significant proportion of population who do not seek healthcare services because they cannot afford to pay for the services that have increased from 4% to close to about 14% in the last three decades. Now, all these are indications that the healthcare in the public health facilities are not hunky-dory story. There is an inequity, and this inequity is much more impactful, much more severe on the population that are extremely vulnerable. And in this case, we are particularly talking about the elderly, where you say that 87% of the population or elderly population, especially women, are looking at someone else to look after them. So, how do you respond to this? I think uh, both center and the states have been trying several options for the past decade or so by extending a number of social health insurance coverage programs, whether they are from started in Andhra Pradesh or in Karnataka or in Tamil Nadu or in many other states which are copied in the later on, in terms of state level uh, health insurance programs. Uh, the center tried to doing, tried doing that under RSBY in the past for the migrant population particularly. But later on in the last three years, we are witnessing the Aishman Bharat uh, PMJY program. Now this all led to something that is good for the country in terms of the, first of all, the most vulnerable population are getting covered by the government in terms of under the overarching notion of universal health coverage under I mean, Aishman Bharat program. Secondly, the program is looking at non-age centric, non-age specific rather, uh, and no pre-existing illness as a constraint for becoming a member of this uh, particular program. But then, if you look at the eligibility conditions in these two, in this uh, uh, PMJY program, uh, ministry people here may have to really reflect upon it. 
the D2 and the D3 conditions mentioned for rural population indicates that any family which has 19 to 59 years of age, right, are excellent. Which I, what I meant is that there is no specific clarity about whether a person above or a family member or a member without any family support above 60 is eligible or not. And today morning I was speaking with one of the uh, NHA official and he said that this is a, a kind of a lapse on the part of the PMJY to look at why it is not very specific in terms of clarifying the above 60 age group. If you go to the urban poor, the eligibility for the urban poor, anyone can just right now look at the uh, you know, PMGOI website and look at the eligibility condition. And if you look at the urban poor, it becomes even more unclear about the, you know, under unemployed or unsupported elderly. What it says is that you need to be a beggar or a rag picker or a maid servant to be eligible. So, which means that if you are above 60 and you do not have a support, you need to become a beggar to become eligible under this program. Again, is something that we will have to reflect and remind NHA whether there is a lapse on their part that we need to really remind them. I think that's where the role of helpage need to really and other NGOs must come in in terms of putting this across to the NHA and trying to uh, make them aware about this la lack of clarity. You also say that only 13% of respondents in your survey point to having a PMJ or beneficiary card. What would it mean also that the helpage and other NGOs need to really have this kind of a role to bridge this gap, to increase the proportion of uh, elderly eligible to become or eligible to get this card and take the healthcare facilities from whichever sources that they wish to take. The third element about uh, PMJY is that the PMJY primarily covers the ailments that lead to catastrophic health expenses that are largely uh, hospitalization, in high-end surgical care. But then elderly may, some of them may require surgical care, but a large proportion of them may also be looking at a chronic outpatient kind of a support services. Do we have a PMJY that can have a, maybe a basic health package or a health benefit package for the elderly design in such a way that their economic well-being is protected because the catastrophic health expenses for elderly who either rely upon pension or do not rely upon any other kind of an income, their own economic survival is not compromised and some health insurance benefit package could be you know, given to them. We are all hopeful that the health and wellness center that Dr. Gauri mentioned eloquently under the PMJY would certainly help the elderly at the community level, especially those with the NCD conditions such as hypertension or diabetes or other kind of uh, ailments, particularly dialysis support and things like that. But what I see is that a lack of some kind of upstream linkages, linkages with the upstream health facilities from the ASHA level towards the specialty hospitals. If we could develop that kind of a referral linkages based on the criteria that Dr. Gauri mentioned about whether they are immobile or whether they are assisted mobile or they are mobile, then accordingly the ASHAs can create channels of transferring these patients to the nearest health facilities or, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> Ritu, I'm running a little fever. So I'm uh, uh, hopefully this, this will be my last sentence. So 
there is a possibility that the ashas are empowered to give these uh, services to the elderly at the community level the last point i wanted to mention about is the digital health solutions i think your uh, report also makes it very eloquent about the possibility of digital health solutions and dr gauri also mentioned and also some other i think dr cherian also mentioned about but do we have digital divide club do we have the digital comfort addressed among the elderly and if these two are not addressed then perhaps digital health solutions are only up to a level where it is a desirable solution but not necessarily an optimal solution finally i would like to end with this i would like you to look at why is that the elderly in india are more seen at ram de ram sorry baba ram dev's ashrams rather than given some kind of hospice care at hospitals so you know there i mean just hypothetically imagine a situation where if we are looking at the integrated care the more younger people should be at baba ram dev and more elders should be at the hospitals but today we are having a reverse order if we need to really look at any kind of a uhc universal health coverage <coughs> on the principles of <coughs> sorry coverage of services in the in terms of scope of services that's where the role of integrated services that dr atri mentioned about in terms of reach of the population that's where dr gauri's proposition about creating the entire paraphernalia of the structure from the medical college downwards to the health and wellness center and lastly in terms of reducing the out of pocket expenses that's where the pmgy this convergence needs to happen and this convergence can happen only if pmgy can look at a holistic approach towards giving healthcare services to the elderly rather than the healthy thank you i stop here uh, uh, thank you uh, sir and uh, despite of your ill health uh, you joined i thank you so much and so grateful to you so you have uh, uh, given us some important points and there are questions uh, about the pmjy and the and that uh, about uh, the the digital comfort the digital uh, divide uh, uh, where we are coming from and and with that because uh, uh, we know that this is the era of technology and every day we witness a new technology is there and telehealth sometimes called as a telemedicine is now a word which is known to almost all digital health technologies are become becoming increasingly developed by day by day in a recent survey by help age india the report we are we are referring by 77% of uh, elders residing in cities and i am talking here about the cities not the uh, rural population they said that they have no access to digital health so you can think about what could be the percentage in the rural uh, rural area with this we have uh, mr parmanand who who is chief business officer apollo telehealth and i request uh, mr param prem anand to share his experience of providing telehealth uh, because uh, polo has been a pioneer in uh, providing telehealth across the country and and having uh, so many uh, uh, i would say uh, like in um, emergencies medical emergencies and also the telehealth uh, tele ophthalmology and all so i would request here uh, dr parmanand to talk about that and also to point about focus on some of the specific aspects what percentage of elderly are availing this digital health and what are the barriers or challenges elderly are facing in uh, in accessing digital health over to you uh, mr preman thank you uh, dr ritu and elpej india it's really a wonderful gesture and uh, effort to put this <coughs> uh, esteemed panel together and it was a great learning thank you for that and greetings to the esteemed panelist <coughs> i understand that the time is extended i'll also try to keep my presentation crisp and clear few points you know many of the panelists who spoke 
who established in terms of the need for elderly care, geriatric care, the policy wise changes and the shortage of infrastructure, the manpower required and the care which requires to reach to the grassroots level uh, almost or at the doorstep of the senior people becomes very pertinent and important. So what I'm not going to, you know, dwell on that particular aspect, veteran speakers have spoken very well. A uh, <clears throat> couple of things which we want to share is, I'm trying to structure this, uh, uh, our learnings, you know, we've been, we are part of a team within the Apollo Hospitals group, which primarily focuses on rural healthcare. We have been uh, doing our work over the last decade or little less than a decade. Our primary aim has been to see how to use technology to bridge various gaps, not only in terms of uh, providing care, but it's, all in, it's also about understanding the infrastructure which is available in the grassroots level, the quality of manpower which is available in the grassroots level, enabling technology, creating business models which are sustainable, and also in terms of building linkages uh, with the targeted communities. We did not, we did do very specific uh, programs into senior livings, not in a public private partnership mode, whereas most of our work, which we have done in the last nine years has been in the public private, private uh, uh, space, as well as in terms of CSR donor funding research and so on and so forth. But when it comes to senior uh, citizens care, we did two specific projects. One pro the first project did not take off well uh, for the sheer reason being uh, we did not get the quantum of seniors living in that gated community. However, one project which we did uh, with a uh, infrastructure company for senior living in Bangalore uh, has been uh, functioning reasonably well. And uh, I'll share a bit more details as I move forward. But we did, we did. Uh, we were able to provide uh, care to over a lack of senior uh, uh, citizens across various PPP programs we do with governments and CSR donors across various parts of the country. So the, my first uh, uh, part of my presentation is going to, because I see that there are a lot of public health professionals, uh, in-depth, uh, you know, focused uh, 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 senior veterans who have worked in the uh, care provisioning and policy framework. On the technology front, I wanted to highlight a little more things. What is possible? So today, if you look at, if you take the telemedicine space, uh, remote healthcare telemedicine space, there are two types of uh, engagement which is possible. Predominantly what you see uh, in, the, in the social media online services are the web-based and app-based services where an application is enabled and people engage through that application and seek the services, healthcare services. Uh, clearly, I think uh, Professor Raman, as well as earlier uh, uh, senior speakers, did mention that you know the utility for them to directly engage in these platforms is uh, curtailed, which is right. The second model is what we are talking about is a, a, a physical and digital model, digital model, which is a facilitated model. Fortunately, uh, our division, which is engaged, is more on a facilitated model. So in this model, what, what we require is uh, our group focuses on the uh, subspecialties, primarily in the allopathy stream of medicine. Though personally, I have some experience working in the homeopathy, Ayurveda stream of medicine for telemedicine also. So we specialize on specific uh, specialties, eye intake specialties, like many of you spoke about ophthalmology, uh, geriatric care. So we develop services for teleophthalmology, teleemergency, counseling, pathology, laboratory services, and each of it has certain nuances when you develop the software part of it, the devices, the medical devices, which get integrated as part of it, also in terms of segmentizing to various uh, age group, gender-wise uh, engagement. So the workflow processes and things like that. So we develop an electronic medical record system, a teleconsulting platform, 
integrated with an ongoing learning environment, continuum of capacity building, so through a learning management system and internet of medical things. So I will share a few of that possibilities in the later stage. So medical devices, which get integrated with the software part of it, and also counseling, pharmacy management, laboratory management system. And holistically, this also overrides a quality aspects of monitoring, evaluating, validating the uh, advice or the, 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 the consultation, which is provided over it. So these are essentially the key parameters. Anybody who wants to get into uh, the uh, telemedicine space and who are trying to use these services should particularly be uh, on the lookout for. Apart from complying, complying to various, you know, the, 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 the patient privacy policies, uh, data interoperability and so on. This is on the technical side. But don't worry, I'm not going to dwell much on it. I just thought it's important. What have we learned over the last nine years is there are multiple subspecialization work which we do, but I thought it's relevant uh, to the senior uh, geriatric care uh, uh, people. These are the essential services. Remote areas where we have seniors who are living and who cannot, mobility itself is a constraint. Over and above that, there are terrain constraints. You know, we run a tele-emergency unit. This is where we got started nine years back in the Imachal Pradesh. It is inside the uh, government uh, uh, regional hospitals and the community health center, 12,000 feet above. We are able to use paramedics, nurses who are trained on advanced life support in an emergency setup, but they are the only people who are available there. They are 24 hours connected to our emergency in any of our quaternary tertiary care hospitals and they are able to stabilize patients. We have elderly patients who come into these, who are brought into these emergency centers who have been stabilized before they can be moved to higher order centers. So these are realities today. These are no more theories, time tested. I mean, this we started even before COVID and COVID just accelerated it, this whole consumption during the, uh, the, the outbreak of two waves where this further got converted into tele-ICUs and remote COVID management wards where without doctors, we did manage about 1800 plus patients across seven odd locations, ventilating them, remotely monitoring them and saving lives. <clears throat> Apart from that, there are concepts like digital dispensary, electronic primary health centers. Uh, e Sanjeevani does a lot of this from the government perspective, but we do it on a turnkey mode. So in states like Jharkhand, we have taken over the primary health center, completely spruced it up, equipped them with the required advanced diagnostic equipments, and patients come there and telehealth facilitators and paramedics do the necessary diagnostics using telelaboratory services, stock medicines, dispense it. I'm sharing this more as a model than what to tell that what Apollo does which can be replicated and it's more relevant to taking care to home. Apart from taking like ICU at home for a patient who is uh, you know, constrained to move and they're confined to their residences or they're in an elderly home and they need more care and things like that. Tele-emergencies now has become a sort of a model where you can set it up inside the communities, you know, geriatric uh, living communities and we can enable services and assure critical emergency care on a 24 seven, almost at their doorstep. These are some of our numbers over there. This is only the numbers which we have done in terms of uh, uh, care given to the marginalized communities. Most of the services are free to the citizens, but they are paid for by the government health system or the donors. We've seen over 20 million uh, you know, clinical interactions with patients done about 1.5 million NCD screenings. Uh, it is possible to actually enable a, a, a skill upgraded resource person who need not necessarily be even a, a nurse, even an ANM or any, anyone equivalent to equip with uh, remote diagnostic kits and make them go to the residences and pick up those parameters and ensure that you know, uh, the, their quality of life is reasonably managed even for chronic conditions. So how much of difference can digital healthcare can make for the elderly? 
Till now, I spoke about certain models which can be relevant to them. Now I'm going to share in terms of what is that we have engaged and how much elderly care people we have served. So these, these most of it is thanks to Helpage India. The data which you published helped us to revalidate the assumptions with which we went into remote paths few years back. So <clears throat> if, if you really look at, I think, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Three validated 28% of them would require uh, uh, senior care by the year 2050. So it's really helping us to revalidate our assumptions. So if you look at 50% uh, of India's disease burden will be from the elderly who are moving up. Uh, particularly diabetes and hypertension. I'm only, there are other parameters we do study, but these things, I, I think one of the, uh, uh, many of these speakers were revalidated is going to have comorbidity kind of con conditions and it's very essential to focus and manage and retain. All these will now start making a huge difference when we bring technology enabled healthcare outreach. 17.3% of the elderly people survey admitted going to regular preventive health checks, which means they have to be mobile and many of them aren't. So now coming specific, some statistics for people who are interested, the current estimated digital healthcare service delivery business is about 43.41 billion INR. And money is important. I know it's more of social angle, one thing we all learned here is resources are important, even if you look at it from a social perspective. And it is expected that it will scale up to 337 uh, billion in a very short span of time. Uh, statistics apart, but this is what I think Professor Raman also validated earlier. And I really wanted to connect back with him on a lot of the data which he shared uh, for a meaningful you know, creation of model. 78% of the elderly find it very difficult to use it. So which means though we have all the technology and the knowledge to build it, people can't use it to really need it in this space. So that is why, uh, you know, I, I, we coined this name called digital telemedicine. So this is primarily a facilitated model. Use relevant medical devices to capture data. It's not necessary. There needs to be a caretaker standing next to the uh, senior uh, uh, you know, uh, geriatric uh, patient. The IOMT devices can transmit this more so for a bedridden patient, also for a limited mobility patient. And today we have, and, and when I'm saying that we have, there are solutions, we are using it, uh, artificial intelligence built kind of solutions which can trigger automated things on a preventive mode so that care can reach in a stipulated time frame to those locations. Of course, these are more, this model is more tested in urban localities, but it doesn't mean rural areas, we can't do it. People say there is no connectivity and we are not able to reach and so on and so forth. That is where we went into this model of turnkey program management, which means manpower, uh, clinicians access, infrastructure requirement, connectivity, everything is in a managed mode on a service delivery. Uh, you know, assurance. So these models are available. Uh, what is our data? This is our own data. I, I, paucity of time, I just took the last two, two and a half years data post COVID. We have done about 2.2 million. Uh, number of teleconsultations that we have done is 13 lakh plus. Within those teleconsults and, you know, various services provided, 1,79,000 of them are above the age group of 60. And the total number of people who got benefited across all our projects is about 13.5% who are senior citizens. So this for me is a very encouraging number because that gives clarity on what segment when we design a program, we need to, this brings in health economics, this brings in, brings in business modeling. When you do it in scale, the cost per beneficiary can come down to as low as 500 rupees per annum. If it is done on a community mode under an Aishman Bharat scheme or things like that. Or for example, sharing some numbers like to do about 100 digital dispensaries almost in, 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 in Gram Panjayat level. And for a population committed 50,000, whether they take service or not, 
they pay like 500 rupees per annum healthcare can be free for the entire community so 13.5% can be augmented into that which is the senior people and medication basic diagnostics when i say basic it's including like, you know, confirmatory tests like HbA1c, lipid profile, anemia, so on and so forth. And with medicines being dispensed for chronic conditions also. So models like this are available. Lot more collaboration has to evolve between government, not-for-profit entities, agencies of private who are interested in working in rural and community health space and bringing down cost. Why Apollo's digital care for works better from our own learning is all telecontrols consults are done by facilitated paramedics. No technical devices or know-how needed for the senior citizens. They are happy to talk to a human interface. Prescriptions reports are printed and sent. Medicines are dispensed at the doorstep or at the nearby facility. You don't have to travel for higher order tests and things like that. Lot of developments in biomedical devices where you need to take intravenous blood today, you can do with capillary blood. This changes the entire dynamics of care provisioning. Specialist available on, on an assurance mode, which means at any given point of time in a day, we do about 12,000 clinical interaction. I'm not saying specific to geriatric population, overall, overall. And that's just a dial away over a video call kind of a thing. And we have digital record now. When, I, when we say that with our kind of input and if government and various entities come together, this can be scaled at much larger level to 20, uh, almost 20 million data digitized with identifiable uh, uh, patient with connects back, follow up becomes easy. Um, I think Dr. Gauri said this, you know, seamless, you know, from one speciality to, to another speciality, the pa patient should not worry about, I need to talk to an ophthalmologist, I need to go to an orthopedician, seamlessly this can be done. And it is happening. So all this are the positive sides of, you know, when you bring in a well-planned, well-structured, digital intervention with the managed services. This is an interesting thing I just wanted to share. So this device is called a, a life sign device. It's not manufactured by us. It's one of those new entrants into the post COVID medical devices thing. This is a small patch. A senior citizen can put it on his body and all these parameters which are enumerated in this slide can be automatically be ported onto a dashboard into a central thing and they can be monitored. And for mobile uh, patients who are limited mobile or who are moving around, but you know, elderly, they can wear this patch and they can be proactively monitored. Now, these gadgets may look like, you know, it's out of a English fiction movie. No, this is doable. It's just that the program management part and technology and the intent has to be in the right mix. So it, it heals results for a lot more larger uh, uh, required uh, uh, senior citizens. This is how our tele-emergency unit looks. Uh, these kind of setups are there inside senior living homes and they're manned by paramedics. 24, you, you see a small screen. So the doctors come virtually, it's an acoustic room. Anywhere when you are mitigating an emergency case, the doctors in the remote end hear it, fully stocked emergency medicine is available. We can even thrombosis and save a myocardial infection patient. To that extent, we have done less than 20,000 emergencies. I'm not counting the COVID emergencies we managed. Snake bite, myocardial infarction, uh, 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 fire accidents, fall, uh, road traffic accident for emergency, uh, stabilization, uh, stroke. Many of this immediate intervention for stabilization and movement has been done in these kind of places. Fire emergencies, which can be handled, the entire list, trauma care, non-trauma care. This is all list based on what we have seen as uh, the kind of uh, uh, requirement and emergency conditions where patients walk into a tele-emergency units. And finally, aging is just another word of living. And, and I personally believe that care to be given with dignity for our elders and for our forefathers who came into this world. And Madam rightly pointed, we are all going to move there investing sooner or later investing in this and collaborating is a moral responsibility and thank you so much for your time thank you
thank you, Mr. Mr. Prem Anand. I'm I'm looking at one question uh, from the participants, and uh, the person is asking: Is there any emergency alarm? Uh, is there? So how, how these remote monitoring, uh, it's, it's particularly comes under the category of tele-IC. So what we have done is uh, four of our hospitals have tele-ICU monitoring hubs. So when we put up these connected devices, when a patient comes in, the entire parameter is streamed in real time. The application itself has configured outliers. So if your blood sugar levels are shooting up, if your keratin is shooting up, it triggers an alarm. But having said that, the legalities in the country doesn't allow to use AI yet. So we are using it more as a backup. And what we do is we have trained paramedics who are monitoring this console 24 seven. So it's currently, though we know technology can automatically monitor, our processes are more of remote paramedics and specialists multiplexing across multiple locations and technology currently is a double uh, backup. Uh, thank you. So I, I am checking here that phys physical telemedicine is uh, the approach uh, which can work in, in uh, countries like India and where the person also needs a, a, the personal touch. Any any patient who wants a personal touch as well, with, which can be provided uh, by a trained medical uh, person who can be a community health worker and a specialist uh, uh, support can be provided to, through the teleconsultation. So physical Physical telemedicine is the word. So, uh, though we are running short of time and uh, uh, we uh, the time is not allowing us to have many questions, uh, the uh, participants can post uh, your Q and A. I in the, the Q and A section will uh, go back to our panelists and have uh, their views on your questions. But Sorry, before, I uh, to mention about the mental wellness in this, there yes. is an automated process of screening mental wellness and detect on a proactive basis for suicidal tendencies and other things. But lack of time, I leave it at that. Technology is available. We are we have been doing that too. Sure. So before we close, uh, I just want to have uh, a, a quick suggestion from uh, uh, Dr. P.T. Sivakumar because Dr. P.T. Sivakumar is also having uh, this uh, Amanas uh, Vayo uh, Sanjeev. Right? And, and they are also a nodal uh, center for providing uh, tele mental health according to the government of uh, India. And has it been started and uh, what challenges does you see uh, providing tele consultation, uh, tele mental well being to the elderly? Yeah, um, thanks uh, for the question, uh, Dr. Ritu. I think uh, the uh, tele uh, psychiatry and tele mental health services have been. Uh, provided by many places and immense uh, started uh, way back before even the guidelines actually were released. And uh, due to the, co I, I think uh, 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 when the COVID uh, kind of pandemic became, uh, 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 there is a necessity for telemedicine actually increased and also the guidelines have come. I think that has actually uh, increased the uptake of telemedicine and telepsychiatry specifically. And now the government has introduced this telemental health program. It was announced in the budget and uh, various consultative meetings have happened and the final proposal as per the, all the consultative meetings uh, it is with the cabinet now so what i'm uh, hearing is that uh, it will be launched soon and uh, uh, this will actually uh, enable integration of various helplines already existing like the uh, uh, health 104 helpline or various other there is a, there are mental health helplines nimans is running Social Justice Ministry is running different state, people are running private also. So many of these things will be integrated in one health, uh, one mental health helpline, which is at the government of India level. And subsequently, this will be routed to all the nodal centers in different languages and different zones, different languages will be available, where uh, trained uh, non-specialists will be providing the first level intervention. And subsequently, uh, it will be linked to the specialist care either at the uh, uh, center's level or at the district mental health program level. I think now the district mental health program is operational at all the districts. And so basically it, it, the whole framework is to kind of provide a continuum of care. And uh, I, I think with the uh, massive effort from the government, I think this should just uh, kind of accelerate. And uh, the, the rural connectivity is a challenge, but I think, but 
uh, this uh, the technology what is being used it is not only uh, video conference it is also possible about cloud telephone i think the penetration even for smartphones is much higher uh, in it is going to only improve so we don't see that as a major challenge but what is the major challenge is about um, uh, there is a need to kind of augment the uh, uh, resources for care because the moment you are having more uh, access uh, people there will be demand i think this has to be supplemented by provision of care not everything can be done by uh, tele so uh, at, at the mental health act actually says facilities have to be provided for uh, the whole uh, package of care like including rehabilitation from primary prevention to rehabilitation i think that has to be also parallelly developed uh, only the tele mental health care will not take care of all the uh, necessities i think the health and wellness program again integration across the programs ncds and uh, health and wellness program aishman bharat all those things are going to uh, be very crucial for the success of this initiative Uh, thank you, Dr. Singh Kumar. And uh, I would like to have more questions, but the time is not permitting me. And I think this kind of webinar uh, may continue for a day long. But uh, we have to stop here because uh, it's it's already one hour, more than one hour uh, delayed uh, for us. So with this, I would like to express my gratitude uh, to all the panelists who has taken time. Um, uh, from their busy schedule and and gave us some uh, insightful thoughts and suggestion that may help in making quality healthcare accessible uh, to the elderly. Uh, we'll uh, we'll look at uh, what uh, how helpage can can work uh, towards that. I'm also equally thankful to my uh, all the participants uh, who have joined and 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 who are uh, patiently listening till the end of the webinar. i must thank to my colleagues and uh, uh, the team at the back end who has been supporting to make this happen i i once and again i thank each one of you and every one of you for joining the webinar i hope uh, to connect uh, once again in your near future thank you all have a good day thank you everybody thank you thank you dr ritu